Hello, my name is Lisa Montalvo. I'm a school counselor at MSSD. That's the model secondary school for the deaf. We're located in Washington, DC. I've worked there for 13 years. Our students are deaf and hard of hearing high school students from all over the United States. We also have some international students as well. I grew up in a family that used spoken language completely, speaking both Spanish and English in the house. My family didn't sign. Growing up, I knew the alphabet in sign language, which I had learned from a family friend, but that was it. My parents were told by the doctor that they needed to use spoken language, that they shouldn't confuse me by using spoke, spoken language and sign language. And not only that, the doctor told them that they should only use English and not Spanish. Even though our family's language was primarily Spanish and we also spoke English in the house, my parents only spoke English to me growing up. I attended an oral program and learned to speak English. In my classroom, all of my peers were hearing. I used an FM system with a listening device and the teacher had a microphone that they spoke into. I didn't really capture everything, to be honest, maybe 40% of what was going on in the classroom. That meant that I had to study extra hard at home, reading and learning in order to keep up. I also got a lot of one-on-one -on -one help from teachers after school. I wish I had learned how to get information through interpreters, but I never had that opportunity in my K-12 education. I remember one time in a biology class, I struggled to understand what was going on. I asked for an interpreter in that class, even though I didn't know sign language, and I was denied. Instead, I was given a note taker that had some special paper that would create a copy that they could give to me, which was an incentive for the note taking student, but I didn't find much interest in. And so I only used it in that class. Instead, I continued to rely on lip reading in order to learn, which was a big challenge. Thinking now, about that experience, I can imagine that if I had had an interpreter in the classroom, I would have learned quite a lot more. I started learning ASL at the age of 17. I went to a deaf camp, and for the first time, I was in an environment that used sign language. I laughed at the facial expressions, but I eventually picked up the language. This, again, was when I was a junior in high school. I remember my family came one day to the camp. It was family day, so there were other families and all of our, all the deaf kids. And my mom was watching me chat with some of the other students. She asked me what I was saying with them. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. Never mind. My mom had a bit of an aha moment. She realized that communication was so important for me. And the shoe was now on the other foot, because growing up, I would ask her what was going on on the TV. She would give me a short summary of what they said, but I didn't believe that, that that was everything. I felt like I was missing out on a lot of communication. So that day that I told her, never mind, helped her realize the importance of communication for me.
remember the first day of going to college. I went to Lenoir Rhine College, now university. There was a deaf program there with maybe 20 or 30 deaf students in it. And the first day of class, I had an interpreter in the classroom. And I was just so fascinated by the language. And I felt to myself, finally, I'm in an environment where I can learn more than I ever did in high school. Sign language was important to me not only in learning through an interpreter, but also in interacting with my peers through sign language. I became much more confident in my language skills during that time. Now, I didn't know the language fluently. I was a little distracted by the language itself, and my friends had to remind me to focus on the content rather than the mechanics of the language so that I wouldn't miss anything. And in that process, I was able to learn both the language and the content that it represented. So I was thankful to my peer group. I joined an ASL class. And that teacher taught several students who were in an ESP. That's an emerging signers program. That program was established in 2004 created by an interpreter who wanted to support the idea of providing two separate services, ASL courses for students to go learn the language and also one-on-one -on -one counseling support for those students who were transitioning from a hearing program into a sign language based program. So the teacher and the interpreter agreed to work together to provide these types of supports during the ASL class time. This would be weekly or maybe twice a month, depending on the group that these supports would be provided. The two types of students in this ASL class were ASL or deaf and hard of hearing students who came to MSSD without any sign language skills, and international students who came to MSSD not knowing American Sign Language, but were familiar with their country's sign language. The support group took on a variety of forms. So by observing those, it helped me decide what types of group discussions would be best. During the group, I do different activities and engage students in discussion. So I'll share some examples for you that hopefully you can use at your schools. I have two icebreaker activities that I really like to use as an opportunity for students to get to know each other and to open up so that future group discussions are more active. The two activities are the t-shirt and the TV activities. The t-shirt activities ac activity asks students to describe who they are through drawings or words, however they feel comfortable. The TV activity asks students to use drawings or words to describe how they think people see them as a person. They do those two activities and then they share out, opening up their experience to the group, which is a great way for them to make connections and to find commonalities.
The American School for the Deaf is proud to sponsor the National Deaf Education Conference, which has created the NDEC Signs and NDEC Engage series this year. During the pandemic, we need to be creative and thoughtful about how we reach our communities, and NDEC has done that for our instructors, administrators, and parents. Thank you. One of my favorite activities that I do with students is called My Journey to MSSD. So we use the letters MSSD printed large on a piece of paper. The M represents me, me, myself, and I, how I feel here at MSSD. Again, the students are free to use words or drawings to describe how they feel. The S asks them to describe how they feel as a student here at MSSD. The second S asks them to describe their signing skills in the MSSD environment. And the D asks them to describe their relationship with deaf culture, what they're learning, and how they feel their relationship is to it. Some students put words, some draw, but in the end, they all use this to share their feelings about how they fit into the school environment. You can do something similar with your school name or some other acronym to ask students how they feel about their connection to deaf culture and their identity as deaf and hard of hearing students. I also like to share a short film called Words. It's a film by Anup Bandari. It's about a man and a woman who meet. The man is deaf and the woman is hearing. She wants to learn some sign language, but in the end, he disappears. This film is an opportunity for the students to discuss why it is that he disappears and to understand the relationship that deaf and hearing people have in the world and to discuss ways to improve communication. I do a lot of self-advocacy group discussions in addition to these activities. For example, during breaks or times when students are at home, I ask them to reflect about what they feel is missing. Oftentimes, communication is one of the big ones. They feel unincluded in family conversations or they miss their friends at school, or they feel like they're starting to sign more with family and the family is starting to learn sign language. So we see a lot of different answers and these are nice ways to get to know how, what students are feeling and what they're going through. This is also an excellent way to discuss ways to improve communication with their families and stand up for themselves. For example, they can say to their families, hey, I don't feel included in this conversation. It's important to me that you sign because I want to understand everything that's being discussed. Can you please do that? This is one way for them to be able to self-advocate in the family environment and become a more independent person. There's another activity that I came up with recently. Maybe you want to try this out in your school. The activity is called, What Shoes Are You?, what shoes fit your identity? Students get together and they look at a grid of different types of shoes and they pick the shoe that matches their identity best. Then I ask seven questions to the group. The seven questions are, number one, why did you pick those shoes? Number two, do those shoes fit your personality? Number three, if you were to pick that shoe, would you change its color? Number four, if you were to change the color, why? Number five, Look at the similarities and differences 
between each other. What do you notice? Number six. Is it okay that people have different shoe preferences? Yes or no? Why or why not? And last, why do you think we're doing this activity? You can, of course, add more questions to your group. It depends on the group dynamic that you may have. I've added questions recently to one group that really gave the group a great experience and allowed them to see the common reactions that deaf and head of hearing, hard of hearing people had and for them to realize that it's okay that we each have a different journey. Some of us may prefer to use sign language 100% of the time. Some others may want to use spoken language more than sign language. Others will want to use both. The result is that students are able to express their differences, to know that it's okay to have differences in our community, and to find interest in the differences and similarities, and develop a bond with each other as they develop their identity as hard of hearing, deaf and hard of hearing people. With the COVID outbreak, and the stay-at-home orders, we've of course had to convert our ESP support groups to Zoom. These aren't in person, but they're meetings that allow us with a hearing interpreter and a deaf interpreter to facilitate these support groups. We didn't want these students to feel disconnected from our community, especially at home in settings where they might not have access to sign language, so that when they do get back to school, they're ready to continue. We've provided other activities through films and live discussions. For example, one film that we showed is called Deaf Bing that Convo produced. We asked them what hearing Bing might look like. And so we got active discussion about that. We were able to maintain connections with these students through sign language, including by, but by including interpreters, uh, we were able to keep those whose sign skills were not quite fluent involved in the discussion as well. And then we asked questions about their fear of using a losing ASL in the home environment where no one signs. These Zoom support groups have continued to allow us to support their acquisition of sign language and their connection to the deaf community. We don't want them to feel alone at home and to miss the school environment. We talked about masks, the pros and cons of using them, and how, especially in the deaf community, it's important to consider communication that when hearing people use masks, deaf people may lose out on lip reading. So I discussed some ways to provide support to emerging signers, and I hope that you may be able to use these ideas in the future. It's important that you support an ESP program if you have one and respond to students' needs. Many students will feel much more confident in the deaf world and become more independent. Some will continue to struggle and may need some one-on-one -on -one support. And you can call on teachers and other staff to provide that. You may want to include events in the hearing world, concerts or whatnot, based on students' needs to support them. And make sure that you are recognizing the variety of attitudes and identities in that group. Some students may latch on to the deaf community and divorce themselves from the hearing world while others will navigate both. For one-on-one -on -one counseling, just be sure that you check in. It's a long journey for these students to get into deaf culture, to understand how deaf schools work, and to learn about themselves through the process. 
they can't be expected to make the transition from a hearing school to a deaf school overnight. It's going to take time. Some will be short and some will be long. What's important in an ESP group is that you develop trust in your students, because if they don't trust you, then they're not going to succeed. The most important part of them providing their trust is to sh for you to show your patience. Open up. Make sure that they're able to get that trust so that they can improve their skills and that they can learn about their own identity as a deaf or hard of hearing person, where they're from, what their journey looks like, because the more that they learn about themselves, the more they'll be able to be the person that they really are. Be mindful of their journey, because every person's journey is different. It's a beautiful thing to learn from their journey yourself. It's a beautiful thing to see how much they grow, how they become different people in that time. Through the ESP support program that I've seen, these students have grown from day one where they didn't know any sign to the end where they're fluent, from the beginning when they're afraid to the end where they're confident. Each of them will have different reactions. Yes, there will be some challenges. Some students will still struggle with their skills or their identity, but it's important that you support them through it. The more support that they get, the more they will feel connected with you and the more they will open up to your support being given. I love this program. It's a really wonderful program. And I've been running this group for a little bit. I've been doing this because I know what it's like to be a hard of hearing person growing up without sign, living in a different world, feeling like a different person and finding a new community and the struggle to define myself. So I put myself in their shoes and I ask you to do the same. You'll see their different reactions and your journey will be different as well. I hope you've enjoyed watching my video Thank you.